So whether you're talking to a reporter, whether you're delivering a presentation, whether you're talking to a lawmaker or a policymaker of some sort, the message and the communication skills to deliver that message are the constants. My guest today is Ed Barks. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Ed. One, he has published four books independently, and the most recent book is Insider Strategies for the Confident Communicator, How to Master Meetings, Presentations, Interviews, and Advocacy. Sounds like a must read. Two, while Ed has watched other consultants come and go. He's happy this year to be celebrating 25 years in business as a, as a communication specialist in communication strategy and training consultancy. Uh, congratulations for that. It, to, to last 25 years is a positive, positive achievement. And, and three, the third fact about Ed is uh, he's a longtime softball player. He, uh, he patrolled center field in younger years and faster years. Ed Barks, welcome to your intended message. Thanks, George. Thanks for your, your, your gracious and understanding introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can certainly relate to uh, uh, standing, uh, get lost out there in center field, wondering why doesn't the ball come out here? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it when it did, and I loved it in the years that I was able to chase it down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how come it's not coming right to me? I got to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's half the fun. <laughs> Ron, get the ball. Ed, um, as a specialist in, in in communication skills, in particular, you have experience in working with the media, and you often help people speak to the media uh, for for their to come across better, more constructive, more productive. Too many people one too many people one are afraid to speak to the media, or two when they do they do a poor job about that. What do you th what do you see are the most common mistakes when when business and community leaders speak to the media? I'm going to kind of flip that a little bit, George, if you don't mind, and talk about the positives of it. And mm. when you look at uh, how you're interacting with the media, you, you need a, a number of things. And let me focus on two right at the top. First is your message. You need a magnetic message or George, as you refer to it, your intended message. So it's a matter of knowing what you're going to say. It's developing that message ahead of time and it's being able to stick to it during the course of your interview. No matter what questions come up and what questions the reporter may toss at you, you need to keep coming back to that message. Now, the second key that I'll mention is the notion of sustained professional development. You can't just do one interview and think you've got it nailed, or certainly you can't go into your first ever interview without any preparation and any planning. So what that indicates is that you need to, over the long haul, sharpen your communications edge. And that involves uh, starting off perhaps with, with low risk situations. Maybe you're talking to a, a, a local shopper kind of newspaper or a trade journal that doesn't get a whole lot of circulation. And then you build upon that until maybe one day you're ready for CNN or the New York Times. Uh, so those are a couple of things that are key right off the top. And Ed, I'm reminded of, uh, while you're talking there, I'm reminded of what it's like to run a marathon. You just don't go out and run a marathon tomorrow. You just don't have an idea. You, tr you train and you start by, you first start by, uh, getting the right equipment and then you start by getting out of the house and maybe walking around the block and then you run around the block and then you maybe go two blocks and three blocks so it's it's progressive over time the more you do it the better you'll get and, and you mentioned a key word there and that's train and and media training is an essential part for for any who hopes to deal with the press now, people think of media training sessions as these you know, half day or day long affairs, and, and certainly they, they can and should be that in some cases, but that's not the end all and be all for your sustained professional development. Yes, you do need that formal quote unquote training where you are marched in front of a camera and you review your interviews afterwards, right afterwards and get some critical feedback. And that feedback should focus on the positives first, because that's where you're going to grow more quickly and more readily. 
and then focus on the challenges that you indicate. And those challenges are something you don't want to overload your brain with. So deal with one of those at a time. And then once you feel like you've, you've kind of got that one under your belt or you're feeling a little more comfortable with it, then move on to a second one. Just don't overload yourself with the negatives first because that can lead to a real frustrating situation. So that's how I like to operate a media training session with my clients. And then, of course, it, it's not just that formal session that, that's the key. It, it's, as I indicated earlier, it's finding opportunities to keep getting better, to keep learning over the long run. Maybe very informal opportunities. Could be you're walking down the hallway if, if you're a communications officer and your, your CEO is about to go into an interview. You, you, you just meet in the hallway and you just walk along for a few minutes and, and toss questions back and forth, questions and answers back and forth. So there are all kinds of opportunities for, for sharpening that skill. Ed, and I'm going to point out a technique that you did because you did it so artfully that the people may not have noticed when we when we at the beginning of the interview I asked you a question which wasn't the question you wanted to go to at that time and you used the phrase I'm going to flip it and talk about the positive which is a wonderful response who's going to say no don't talk about the positive uh, and and so there's a technique that you did so sub, uh, so so artfully that people might not have noticed but it was technique well, yeah, thanks for mentioning that, George. And of course, I'm, I'm not surprised you picked up on that, but, but I'm glad you did for the sake of your listeners. And there are a number of tried and true techniques when you're dealing with Q&A. Uh, it, it's, it's, you, you don't want to get in a situation where the reporter is digging a hole and inviting you to say, oh, would you please step into this hole for me and, and just you know, totally fall apart in your interview. So there are a number of, of Q&A techniques, and we can go into some of those later if you like. But, but again, this is all part of anybody who's going to deal with the media. It's got to be part of your, your toolkit. And I guess it's worthwhile to point out what, uh, is that the, the journalist isn't always going to ask the question that you want to, that you want to answer the most. And, and it's not that they're being mean. It could be that they, they don't know your agenda. They're, perhaps they didn't do their homework well enough, or perhaps they're, they're just, they're, their mind is somewhere else. And so they just go back to their standard, standard uh, line of questioning that they used last week and the week before. And so it's not that they're bad. And they will generally, in most cases, appreciate when you save the interview. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the ways you, you can help kind of short circuit that process is to send the reporter a list of suggested questions. Now, is every reporter going to go down that list verbatim and read those questions? Of course not. Now, now some will especially more inexperienced uh, trade press reporters, for example, who tend to be more friendly in most cases, unless you're dealing with some kind of contentious issue. Uh, but it's also important to remember that reporters aren't necessarily out to get you. And if they are, you ought to know that based on your, your advanced research but they're not necessarily out to get you. In fact, that's one of the reasons I titled my third book, Reporters Don't Hate You because it's not necessarily so. And and it's I guess it's fair to say that reporters are simply doing a job and, and their job is to report the news, but report the news in an interesting way. Yeah, and you've got to make it interesting in your way as a spokesperson for your company or your organization. You need to figure out, you know, what does the reporter want from me? What's this all about? What have they covered before? Who have they talked to previously? All kinds of background research questions like that. And, and plug that into your preparations so that you know when you are delivering your intended message exactly what phrases, perhaps what examples, what stories are going to resonate with the reporter that you want to see them writing down. You want to see them scribbling madly at some point. And then you know you've hit the home run because that is probably what's going to wind up in their story. And so let's go to that situation. Here I am. I'm um, I'm a, a leader in a in a in a business, uh, perhaps a VP of marketing, or or, and I get a message. There's a phone call or an email. It's the media. The media wants to talk to me. What should I do? Do I panic? Do I do I or do I, I call? Speak to Ed first. Speak to Ed. He's our spokesperson. 
Yeah, my my urging to, to everyone who deals with the press or may ever deal with the press is never pick up that phone and launch into an interview right away. Even if the reporter says, hey, I'm on a really tight deadline, I've got to put this to bed in a half an hour, you still need to take that five or 10 minutes to get your mind centered, to get your message squared away in your mind. The way I like to put it is you need to internalize your message so that you can verbalize your message. So you need to take some of that, some prep time to, so you're not caught unawares and, and you know, your, your mind is just on, on the right frequency at that point. So never, ever deal with a reporter on the spur of the moment. Now, when that call comes in, what you want to do is loop in some of your experts in communications. If, if you have a communications officer in a house, that's wonderful. That's great. If not, you have a consultant on the line, that's someone you should talk to as well. If it's a, a, a critical issue, perhaps a crisis that's bubbling up, then you need to get both those folks involved, both your internal uh, staff, communication staff, and your external communication strategy consultants. Let's, let's start with good news. Let, let's start with good news, uh, the positive. Uh, so we're... Um... We're at an industry event, a, a trade show. There's new. We're launching new technology. We're building a. We're opening a new plant. We've got some good news. How do we? First of all, how do we get the attention of the media? Uh, do they care? Do they want to hear good news? Well, you've got to figure out number one if you have a story to tell that's going to resonate. And you know, I, I think we've all seen these news releases come out that you know. So-and-so was promoted from vice president to senior vice president. I mean, honestly, nobody cares. So let me refine that just a little bit. You might find that one trade publication that follows industry positions, and that might be okay. You might get a half a sentence in there for something like that. So with your issues as, as an organization, you've got to figure out, is there any traction here? Is this something reporters are going to be interested in, or are we just writing news releases to write news releases? And here's a line that I've seen uh, in, in, at the beginning of many news releases. So, so-and-so organization um, is pleased to announce. And I always thought, who cares that you're pleased? <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's uh, you, you can substitute any number of words. We're excited. We're 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 you know just any number of words lately that have that have kind of fallen into that that uh, that that genre. And you're absolutely right. It, it's not important what you feel. It's important what you can deliver to, of course, the reporter. But more importantly, that reporter's audience. That's who they care about. That's who they're writing for. That's the eyeballs they're trying to get. That's the subscription they're trying to sell. So it, it's a matter of figuring out not what's important to you, but the, the, the issues that are important to you, how can you translate them to the public that you're trying to reach, to your target audience? Why would a business want to appear in the media? How does that help their business? Well, it could be any number of ways. It could be an enhanced reputation. It could be something accruing to the bottom line. It could be something you mentioned a few moments ago that you have a new product or, or you have a, a, you know, a, a new initiative of some sort. Maybe it's a public policy initiative you're, you're trying to get across. You, you know, here in the U.S., where you might be dealing with Congress uh, and, and trying to advocate before your legislators. Uh, or it might be a town council if, if you're looking for some, if you're building a new plant and you're going through an approval process of some sort. Uh, you, you know, so there are all kinds of bottom line benefits that can accrue to a business if the outreach is done in the right way and, and not in a ham handed fashion. And I suppose we know that an organization, when you advertise, we know that those are your words, that's your opinion. So we take that, you know, with, with a, a grain of salt there. We, we just don't trust everything you say in the ads. But when it comes through a reporter who we tend to believe uh, is, um, is objective, or at least we know the reporter's position, so we know their mindset. And if that's someone we admire and trust, we're more likely to trust their interpretation of your message. I, I know that was a long way to get there, but uh, the, the point is that when 
when you're in the media, we tend to believe it more than your advertising. Yeah, absolutely. And, and George, I know you've got a media background and, and you may well have had some experience in that regard as well. Uh, true, true. And, uh, and, and what it does help is it helps you when you work with the media, get to see different perspectives and, and the, 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 the perspectives that you don't see if you're working only in industry. And you might say, well, well, we have a message to deliver. Well, who cares? <laughs> and, and by the way, um, is it believable? It, it, you know, it might be incredible. And or who can understand what the heck you're trying to say? Yeah, and, and those are both good points in terms of believability and in terms of, frankly, who cares? It, and, and so after you develop your message, and, and I, I don't mean to say there's an end point to that because it's an always evolving creature. But as you get towards the, the point where you're ready to roll out that message to your public, then you need to do a few things beforehand. You need to road test it. You need to figure out, you know, where are the weak points here? So one thing I like to recommend to clients is when you're ready to test that message, and one great way to do that is to get your spokesperson in the room and toss some questions at them. Make it everything from you know the 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 ones you you just anticipate. You know they're going to come. Tell me about your product. Tell me about your initiative. To the routine to to some of the friendly questions that you might plant or excuse me suggest to the reporter, and then the real hardballs that you you really don't want to hear but you know they may arise. So bat some Q and A back and forth with your spokesperson. And one thing I like to recommend is to bring the office skeptic into that room so that that person can just be the one to say, hey, you know, you're off base here. That's not the way it works, is it? And see how your spokesperson reacts to that. So having that office skeptic in the room is, is invaluable. The person who might say, w w didn't you try this last year and it flopped? Why, why, why is it going to work? Why do you think it's going to work this time? That's a question that needs to be asked. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I would always suggest, too, that, that you as an organization define what those questions are. And when I say define, I mean write them down. Put them on a list. And, and I like to put them in three buckets. And, and they're the, the buckets I mentioned earlier. The ones that are expected that, that you know are going to come in nearly every interview. The ones that are friendly that you want to hear. And the ones that are very challenging that you, you do not ever want to hear those words pass a reporter's lips in that exact order. Nonetheless, it may come. So you better be ready for it. And when when one is being interviewed by a reporter, is it is the rule that you must answer every question? Well, you have to answer every question, sure, but on your terms. And what I mean by that, we, we, talk, we spoke a few moments ago about some, some techniques for dealing with Q&A. And so you need to look at how you can manage those questions and, and build a bridge from that question to your intended answer, your intended message. So look at how you can take the question and build upon it. And you don't want to be accused of spin. You know, I'm not saying that, that you, know, you, you, you have to, we've all heard these, these you know, Sunday morning talk shows where the host says to the senator, well, gee, isn't this a beautiful day outdoors? And the senator says, well, yes, my favorite color is red. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't be talking on, on two distinct planes like this. You have to find a way to meet in the middle. So that's where those techniques for Q&A uh, come into play. And I go into those in depth in, in, in uh, both Reporters Don't Hate You and in the most recent book, Insider Strategies for the Confident Communicator. And Ed, let's just uh, let people know where they can find out more about your books. Uh, it's uh, at your website, and the link is below. And, and for those listening, it's Barks com but with two m's as in communication.com so barkscom mm, dot m dot com <laughs> exactly right um ed in um in the in your most recent book where you talk about meetings presentations interviews and advocacy what are the common elements well a common element to everything there is communication and, and another common element is message no matter who you're talking to, when you're reaching out as a company, reaching out externally, 
you need to have that message squared away. So whether you're talking to a reporter, whether you're delivering a presentation, whether you're talking to a lawmaker or a policymaker of some sort, the message and the communication skills to deliver that message are the constants. The phrase, no comment. <laughs> Please, no. Don't, don't ever. <laughs> yeah, it, unless you're the kind of person that likes to hop in a bull ring and wave a red cape, uh, don't ever say no comment in, in, in the course of a discussion with a reporter. This gets back to what we were just talking about moments ago, which is having those techniques to respond to questions so that you don't get trapped, you don't get that deer in the headlights look and be forced to say no comment. That, that does not make anybody look good. I know it's a favor to lawyers and, and you know lawyers I've talked to and I have had various discussions about this and they've got it, lawyers have a different agenda, right? So if, if you're dealing in a communications forum, if it's a, a crisis or a legal issue of some sort, yes, you need to get the lawyers involved, but they need to be part of the discussion and not the deciders of the discussion. That needs to be, and that needs to come from the C-suite with input from legal, from communications, perhaps from public policy or government relations, whatever issue you're dealing with, those experts need to be in the room too. But the lawyer should not, in, 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 in my view, in any case, have the final say of, of how you're going to approach an issue. I suppose if the lawyers had their way, then they would, everybody would just shut up. Don't say a thing. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's understandable because they have a different, a different view of the world, a different sense of their responsibilities to the company. So yes, there is a bit of tug of war on occasion there. Uh, again, I'll emphasize that it should be a collaborative effort and, and the C-suite really needs to be the one to make that final decision because that's, that's why they're there. Handling a crisis. There, there, there's, there's a crisis in, in, in the business. Uh, perhaps uh, it's an environmental mistake. Uh, perhaps it's a safety issue and, and there's tragedy. How, how best to handle that when the media comes calling? Yeah, and George, every business has its own definition of a crisis. For for some, it, it may be that 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 environmental spill that you talked about. For others, it may be the death of a key partner, or it may be something that that to you know a large firm would seem trivial, but to a small business might be just the the death knell of things. So, in terms of crisis, you 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 really need to focus on the communications part of it. But there's a broader scope to it as well. And, and I am by no means a crisis expert. I mean, I, I can deal with the crisis communications part, but there are experts out there who deal with crises and, and their various aspects on a regular basis. So it, it's, it's wise to get input from folks like that in addition to the communications piece of things. Mm. I suppose, and, and I'm not a crisis expert either, but I suppose that one needs to tell the truth, but one doesn't need to tell everything. Yeah, it's not a courtroom where you have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, you have to be honest at all times. If, if you're not, you're, you're in a crisis, you may be in legal jeopardy. But more importantly, with reporters, you're, you're done as a source. You, you are absolutely cooked because they know they can't trust you. And if you lie, you're finished. And, and frankly, that's the way it ought to be. The magical sound bite. How do we create one? Yeah, you know, a lot of that is is getting the the right group of people in the room and 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 just batting ideas back and forth. It's getting certainly your your individual who's going to be your spokesperson for that issue. It's getting your communications uh, staff in there, at least the the, the senior folks, and and it's getting some of the issues uh, experts within your company who are responsible for that issue. Now, when you go into a messaging session like that and, and you're developing your, your sound bites, then it, it's, you don't wanna overload the room because that is not, trust me, it's not gonna be productive. I've seen companies try to do that and it's just that there's too much input at that stage. So you know, start off with the, 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 the folks who are intimately involved and then work from there to fine tune those, those magnetic messages. And two, two came to mind right now while you're talking there. And the one I think of is um, Steve Jobs when he announced the, the iPod. 
I have a thousand phones in my pocket. What a great line. Yeah. You know, and, and it's interesting you mentioned Steve Jobs because so many individuals, uh, so many presenters try to be like him. And that is the wrong thing to do. Now, I'm not saying don't borrow techniques from people that you see and respect and who are adept at talking to the public. Sure, by all means. But to try to copy someone, no, I mean, you are you. So take the strengths that you have, build on those, figure out where your challenges are, work on those over the long run, and you're going to be much better off. You know, I, I had occasion last month to, to work on with a client on a media training session, and I came across in preparation for that session a video of Tim Cook, who was the, the successor to Steve Jobs as CEO at Apple. And it was Cook's first ever product rollout. And we all remember Steve Jobs, you know, the, the black turtleneck, the dress totally in black and, and walking across the stage. Well, Tim Cook tried to be Steve Jobs. And I'm here to tell you that didn't work. And the video is, is out there online. Uh, and, and, you know, he just tried to be somebody he wasn't right down to the wardrobe and, and pacing across the stage. Jobs knew how to do it. Cook looked like a pendulum, you know, five, six steps one way, five, six steps the other. And he kept going back and forth. And, and he, you could tell that he wasn't in his own skin. So, so be yourself, bring out the best in you as a communicator. And that's difficult for a lot of people to do because they, they see their own faults and they think, oh, I, I can't be myself because I'm, I'm flawed. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And in, in, in nearly every case I can remember, and as you indicated, I've been doing this for 20, nearly 25 years now. In nearly every case, when I work with clients in a training session, we, we will video record their exercises, whether it's a presentation or whether it's a, a reporter interview with me portraying, putting on my old reporter's hat from years ago and interviewing them. It, what will happen at the end as we review before we review the video is I'll turn to that individual and say, okay, tell me one or two things that really worked for you there. What was positive about that? And they might come up with one thing typically. And then they start off, but you know, I just, I said, um, too much, or I didn't make good eye contact. And, and, and I, I just have to say, well, 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 wait, wait, we'll get there. We'll get there, but we're not talking about the challenges yet because I wanna reinforce within your brain what's really working for you and how you can maximize your ability to reach out to the press, to deliver presentations, whatever it may be. And, and what I'm hearing there is, and, and tell me if I've got this right. So what I'm hearing there is, is first get clear on, on your message and get comfortable with your message and get comfortable with yourself. Yeah, that's a big part of it. The, the, the message is clearly a very big, plays a very big role in terms of what you want to be comfortable with. It's got to be your words. Now, that you may have, if, if you're in a larger company, you may have numerous people delivering the same message, talking in different forums, and that's fine. And everybody might have a different story to tell. They might have different words that, that they prefer to use, different examples, and that's fine too. However, the messaging, the, the bottom line of the messaging needs to remain consistent throughout the organization. And, and Ed, I'm thinking there of company mission statements or value statements. And the, the mistake is when, pe well, when people actually do know what it is <laughs> <laughs> and, and they simply repeat it as, as is without really meaning it? What are you suggesting they do differently? Uh, I would stay away from reading rote mission statements. Uh, you know, I mean, they're fine. If you want to do a mission statement for your company or a vision statement or whatever you want to call it, you know, go ahead, do it, make somebody happy. I'm fine with it. Um, however, that don't confuse that with, uh, to put it in your words, George, your intended message. That doesn't have all the, the richness that your message deserves because it, it, a message can be a complex thing. You, you know, my take is you need four points, four legs of a sturdy chair to every message. And under each of those points, you have to build in proof. 
so that it's not just you saying something. The reporter isn't necessarily going to believe you, even if you look like the nicest person in the world. So you need to prove to that reporter what it is you're saying is actually true. So underneath each one of those points of your message, you might have a story to tell. You might have a third party reference of some sort. You might have an analogy to deliver. You might even be able to cite an opponent on occasion who says nice things about you. So look for those kinds of things that really prove what it is you're saying is indeed the case. And, 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 and you can lay some proof points out as well. Why four points? For, you know, that's what the research shows. Um, I hear a lot of, and, and I've, I've collaborated with a number of consultants over the years, and I, I keep hearing, you know, three, three, three. Well, uh, I, okay, I've done the research. And, and, and the fact is, you know, we, we can maintain in our brains about, we can maintain in our brains four points in terms of in our short-term memory to keep us going. So that's the way people tend to dole out information and receive information. Now, among those four points, it's not just a collection of bullet points. And, and believe me, I've seen when I ask clients for messages before entering into a, a, a project with them, I, I see a number of different things. Sometimes the, the reaction is, are, 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 what are messages? Or, what do you mean messages? And written down? Oh, come on now. Okay, so that's, that's one reaction. Another reaction is, and this is the most typical, is four or five pages of bullet points that are just wholly unrelated. They're not organized. And how a spokesperson can ever make sense out of that hash is, is, just, is, is just impossible. And, and the, the third uh, category is the companies that have the messages just, they're, they're wonderful. They're elegant. They're on one page. They're backed up by proof. That is, I am sad to say, the, the least common among the reactions that I get. Mm, one page, one page, nice, neat. Sounds like valuable advice. Ed, uh, in wrapping up, if you could offer business leaders or community leaders one, two, or three pieces of advice when it comes to managing themselves in the Q&A with the reporter, what might be those one, two, or three pieces of advice? And maybe it's something you've said already. Yeah, it, it all gets back to message, George. And, and the fact is, have your message internalized so that you can verbalize it. And with respect to every question, always look to get back to at least one part of your message, one of those four strong legs of your message that we talked about a few moments ago. Commit with respect to each question, you are going to deliver your message. And, and kind of point 1A underneath that is to work on those techniques that allow you to deal with Q&A seamlessly so that you know how to, for instance, bridge from one message, uh, from one question to your message, that you know how to perhaps drop a trail of breadcrumbs at the end of your, your response by saying something like, and that's not all, or I can give you more examples about that. Well, the reporter's next question might well be, oh, okay, well, go on, tell me more. So those are a couple of ideas to keep in mind as you are dealing with reporters and their questions being lobbed at you. Mm, practical techniques to keep in mind there, Ed. My guest today is Ed Barks, reminding you that first you internalize your message so that you can verbalize your message. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you convey your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.